Welcome back. We're being joined by someone I would order his activities as architect, an activist, and a politician, just in that order. Uh, he's the Lagos son of the soil. I think that is uh, something that I can call Omoluabi, as you say. Omoluabi Eko. Omoluabi Eko. Let's welcome uh, Badebo Rose Vivo, the governorship candidate of Labour Party. Welcome. Good to be here. Yeah. It's good to have you again. Uh, well, but I've always wondered why, knowing the kind of family you come from, that you never ended up being a lawyer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what really, what happened? What went? Yeah, I, 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 well, to be honest, I'm very passionate about uh, science. Mm. I was top of my class in chemistry and biology, a third in my class in math. But I was also very interested in poetry. I was also very interested in painting. So mm. I looked for something that married art and science and architecture. Oh, architecture now fit the bill. So yes, you, you went did. into architecture. Yes. And then, but you, you did your studies outside Nigeria and then mm -hmm. you came back to Nigeria and you, you branched off from, from the science that you've always done and you did something about policy. Yes. So uh, when I decided to go into politics, I felt that I needed a theoretical framework for that. So I went to Unilag and got a master's in research and public policy. Oh, that's, that's why you did that policy. Okay, but you have been an activist. Uh, you've, you've, you've heard something about uh, uh, GMO. Yeah, uh, genetic like modified you've, foods. You've talked about, you've, you've, you've also led a delegation, as it were, or a protest, or whatever they, <laughs> I would want to yeah. call it, uh, to the National Assembly, talking mm -hmm. about so many other things, one of which is to return, um, your history. advocacy has to be been to return history into the curriculum. Yeah. So why, why do you have that kind of a passion? You know, um, history is extremely important. History is the means by which society programs its citizens on best behavior and behavior that they actually are looking for a majority of people to uphold. Mm. Now, unfortunately, in Nigeria and most African nations have never really taken advantage of that. We still have children being told that Mongo Park discovered River Niger river that the ancestors were bathing in when Europeans were probably still living in mm -hmm. caves. You have a situation where history that we're being taught probably starts in 1960, and everything that existed before colonization has been painted as bad and negative and evil. So when the people don't see themselves in history, don't see themselves in greatness, understand their story, you always find that they look outside of themselves to solve their problems. So that needs to be changed. We need to trace our history and our understanding of our path in the world back to ancient empires. We need to tell the story of our glory as human beings, as people that contributed to civilization and were not receivers of civilization. Until then, when a pride really comes from the inner being of a person, you cannot see yourself as operating as excellent. Okay. And that's what needs to change. Uh, well, congratulations will be in order because history has been returned to the curriculum. But the worry is, yeah. is it the kind of history you want to be taught? No, that uh, our history needs to be completely revamped. You know, there is a history that is being taught. You have to think about history in terms of what are you programming your citizens to believe. I'll give you an example in America. The history is taught that slavery or that slave trade was and it was, was um, migration of labor. Wow. They don't call it enslavement, right? Because they want to program their children to think of themselves as excellent without any stains. They will program it. They can go on and find out the reality later on in life. But you see what gives the American, the French, the British, a sense of exceptionalism is the history an education that they've been baked in, in mm. the education system. And that's what we need to start looking at history based on. What are the things that we did? What are the people that we're going to celebrate? What are the men and women that we're celebrating? What are the kingdoms that existed? What was their interrelationship across Africa? Why you want us to start trading with other states in Africa? Right, that, that inter African trade is at a low. If you want to send something to Namibia, it'll have to go to Germany and then come back down. You know, you need to start making these places familiar 
in the minds of your citizens. You need to start inter interlacing the migration movements from northern, um, where we call Egypt now, formerly Kemet, down into Oyo, down into this part of Africa, and trace Mansa Musa's movements. I mean, there's so much greatness that we need to explore uh, that unfortunately, uh, but you cannot give what you don't have. If the people in charge of these things don't actually have this understanding of history, they can't give what they don't have. Okay, that brings us to <laughs> politics proper because mm. uh, people who are in charge need to be the ones that can give what they have. Exactly. Do you think the new generation has what it takes to take over the political space? That's a very good question. Have what it takes. I think your political leaders should be a reflection of the people that are taking politics seriously at any point in time. If people get the leadership that they deserve. Um, I do feel that there are a number of young, vibrant politicians and there's a movement now, especially the obedient movement, that is stepping up to take responsibility for where they want their government and their future, what they want it to look like. And I think that that is enough. But we also need a lot of people to do much more. We need a lot more people to come to the table to understand that they play a role in determining who their leadership should be and what that leadership should look like. And it's extremely important that the people put politicians in position. Politicians don't buy their way into position. So when you see a leader or potential leader that's aspiring for presidency turning down opportunities to appear at debates, it's because at the back of his mind, he believes that he's going to use his money and buy his way into office. He does not need to sell himself. And in not needing to sell yourself is also saying that you're not going to be accountable to the people because the people don't matter. Their opinions don't matter. We don't, you're not going to give them the opportunity to hear your thought process and you're just going to go around the country throwing jibes at other candidates and not really saying much, having other people read your manifesto and you know, it just makes for very bad politics. In my opinion, a politics that will move Nigeria forward. It makes for good politics in keeping the status quo of what Nigeria has been mm -hmm. and has been in the past. But that's not what we one. want. It's not what we want. But if it's not what we want, we need to do something about it. But do you think the problem is the age? Or because a lot of people will just argue, everybody old out, everybody new comes in. Do you think the problem is just the age? Do, be you, do you believe that if everybody at the helm of affairs is a youth, for instance, things will be better? No, I don't believe that. I think that the number one quality we need in Nigeria now in leadership is empathy. We need a leader that has empathy, genuine love for people, that is willing to put that love before his own interest. We need a leader that has high cerebral capacity, is able to manage things and you know, has high intelligence to be able to make things happen, innovation-wise, and put things in place. And also appreciate and respect intelligence and not be insecure about it. There are a lot of leaders that cannot stand being around intelligent people because they feel that they will not shine or they feel that they will be belittled, right? So you need an excellent leader so that that team around that leader can also be excellent. That leader can thrive in excellence, right? We need a leader that comes with a level of integrity, that puts some level of value into their word and what they said they would do. In the last eight years, we've seen that completely gone out. You know, somebody comes out and says we are the safest country in Nigeria, that, you know, um, petrol is selling. They did not promise this. They said they would do this, but now they're not doing it. And we are literally watching us live the realities of a failed state, but they're coming and telling us every time that Nigeria is working, but they're doing excellently well. You know, we need integrity and we need courage. We need leader of courage to actually take the right decisions to move this country forward. So it's more than youth. It's important to be healthy. Nigeria is already a sick nation. We cannot hand it to the hands of a sick leader, right? We need health, you know? And also you need a situation where you have a leadership that genuinely has a vision and understands the dynamics of the country and is willing to manage resources by trying to do things unconventionally and using innovation to reduce our cost and wastefulness. Okay, I'm wondering how we can measure integrity. I've seen a lot of good men go into politics and you say this man is a man of integrity, a man of his words and all that. And he gets there and like I usually say, 
they seem to be bitten by a bug <laughs> that spoils them and they become something else we never imagined. So do you think or what are some of the things that can be done so that the person who goes in as a man of integrity can stay a man of integrity? We can hold the people who are leaders accountable because sometimes, like they say, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Maybe you get there and there are no tools to hold you responsible for your actions. So what are some of these things that we can do to make sure that our leaders stayed the way they were before we gave them the job? I, I have, yes, I agree with you 100%. At the same time, we must also remember that we've had leaders that have lived up to this. Alaji Latif Jakonde is one of these people. He showed a high level of empathy. In four and a half years, he accomplished what this government in the last 20 years have not been able to accomplish. Right? And did this with the civil service. Right? So it is possible. Um, you look at His Excellency Peter Hobby, the marks of integrity all across his government, where he managed it and did things in the right way that it should be done. And that's what is giving him this support base that he currently enjoys. Now, for me, I feel that the most important thing for us is to start your foundation of governance with transparency and accountability opening up your books, acceding to the Freedom of Information Act, ensuring that contract sums are based on a benchmark, right? That's taking into consideration, okay, Eastern Africa, Western Africa, and trying to get the best deal possible and being open about this with the people, you know? I think once you've set that foundation, even if you want to turn crooked later on, you cannot because that foundation has been set. And the moment you turn now start to make your accounting and your finances, especially your contract awardees and all of that opaque, then people will know that there's something wrong. So that's one thing, that's an idea, that's part of our vision that we are committing to do as Governor of Lagos okay. and will be able to keep us on the right track. But right now you're talking about the person who is at the helm of affairs doing something to keep himself in check. Is it that some of these things that should keep the leaders in check are not available, no instruments available in our polity that can keep the leaders in check, that you have to invent what will be good enough for you? I mean, I think it's not even a matter of opinion or subjectivity. Our leaders are not in check, right? I mean, you look all across the country, the leaders are not in check. Uh, the only time where you start to see what is really going on is maybe when there's a fight between them and somebody is talking about how a boho was drilled for 70 million naira, or somebody is coming and on releasing information to the public. But that's not normally the case, right? So we, we need a situation where leaders take this and institutionalize openness and accountability, and then also respect it, because you can be, open, you can be openly stealing, and nothing comes out of it. And you don't even have shame. You see, they say you cannot shame the shameless. <laughs> <laughs> We're hearing that people are cutting grass for 200 and something million. Snakes are swallowing monies. Yeah. Monkeys have carried monies. Termites have... No shame. Like, the person that's saying, giving that excuse, you would think that they would be ashamed, but they... No shame. And that's the new normal in our country, and that needs to be reversed. How, how do you think the person who wants to uphold integrity can survive in a system that uh, has been rigged by those people who wanted to always favor them and their kin? Well, first of all, you have to be courageous and not go the route of you can't beat them, join them, by joining the ruling party that has the power. Right? So that's the first decision that you're going to make. The second decision is you work really hard to actually create a system that makes their system obsolete. And you get into position by God's grace and with the help of the good people of the country, in a party that is in opposition. So when you get in position, you now have the opportunity to set things right. Now, if I go into the ruling party and think I'm going to change things inside it overnight, I'm deceiving myself. Because it's a status quo that has built itself around maintaining itself. It's created a beast that has created the entire country to feed that beast. Right, so going in there and trying to change anything, you are deceiving yourself. If the young people, older people, you're deceiving yourself. You might do some little positive things in one corner, but overall, you're not working in the interest of the people. 
Uh, this might sound funny, but is that why you ran away from the PDP? Uh, the PDP in Lagos State has been in opposition for 20 plus years. So in, I joined the PDP because of these same things I've talked about, right? And the PDP was a party where agreements were made, right, between the leaders and the eventual flag bearer, myself as well, and it was reneged on, you know, and when I cannot stay in a party where I cannot sell the candidate even if I'm not the candidate, because the person completely lacks integrity, is not a man of his word, and really not honorable, and has no reason to actually be qualifying or running for a position like that. So I excused them. And I went into the Labour Party, started afresh, learned the ropes, and by God's grace, emerged as a candidate. Uh, some people say that you were fingered to be the running mate to the person who is now running as mm -hmm. governor. In PDP. Yeah, that's the argument I'm talking about. It's not something I was particularly excited about, right? But you see, party, party politics is also about consensus. Mm. It's about um, the minority has their say, but the majority has their way. And leaders in party that I respect a great deal, um, BOT members of the party felt that this would be a very good arrangement that allowed for a seamless sort of politic. And, you know, eventually I gave into it and I agreed. But I have to put on record to say that it's not a partnership that I particularly I wanted to run. I was, in, I was running to be governor, candidate of the party and governor of the state. You know, but um, the party had these ideas. I agree with them. And unfortunately, like I said will happen, the candidate broke those agreements and showed he's not a man of honor or integrity. Okay, so it was the sole decision of the candidate uh, that brought in a different person to, to run as the running mate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the prerogative of the candidate to choose the deputy. Okay. Now, what gives me concern, and a lot of some other people, is the fact that when first time we met and we talked like this, you were running on the COA party. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons you gave for running under that platform, like you have said now, uh, is the fact that COA did not have the godfather factor. Mm -hmm. You know, people were allowed to do their things the way they, sh they could do them and all that. So, the next time we heard about you, you were in PDP that mm -hmm. has godfathers, whether we see it any as anyhow, PDP has godfathers, mm. so same as APC and maybe some other parties. And then it was after the agreement in PDP were not met that you went to Labour Party. Mm -hmm. So we need to know what, how that switch went. We need to know what you were following around that made you take these kind of decisions, even when uh, your first appearance in COA Party seemed to define what you needed in the party as the direct opposite of what is obtainable in PDP. Uh, I won't say direct opposite. You see, I've been very consistent. Um, all my movement has been, has been anti-APC. There's never been a point. Typically, people will do opposition party. The next move they make, they go and join the ruling party, typically. It has all been anti-APC. That's one. Two, the PDP in Lagos State has never been in government. They've never held local government chairmen, you know, majority of them. They've had a number of state assembly that then decamped. They had a number of House of Rep members. But they've never been in government. So everything I disdain about how Lagos has been run is in the hands of the APC. Right? And when you look at a party that has been in opposition for that long, there is that opportunity to come in and win and actually chart a new course for how governance should be. Right? So even when you talk about godfathers, I will there, there are people that are in power. Like for instance, if you are in Adamawa and you want to contest, you have someone that has been a vice president in your, you have a situation where you have controlled the state, right? You, you've handled all, you've produced men that have, that are political giants, right? Then you have this serious godfatherism. But here you have leaders, right? I'll call them leaders, right? And in your emergence as now the leader of the party, you have a very strong opportunity because you are the first to actually set the pattern and path of how governance will go in that state. And in the situation where all of that backfired, right, in terms of agreements and all that, I did not go to the APC. 
having to Labour Party. So there's a serious consistency here, right? And it all still stems to getting on a platform, doing the work to deliver good governance to people on our own terms. Okay, well, uh, there's still so much to talk about uh, regarding that. But Bayo is standing by. Um, uh, I'm sure he has a, a contribution to make, questions to ask or something. Bayo, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I yes. hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, good morning, Mr. Rose Vigo. Good morning. And uh, yeah, it's really nice hearing you speak. Um, Lagos reportedly contributes 30% of Nigeria's GDP. Uh, Nigeria's GDP for 2021 was put at 440.8 billion US dollars, which still makes Nigeria the largest economy uh, in Africa. But Lagos contributes 30% of that, so that's roughly about $90 billion. Um, yet, people might say that there's a lot that has happened in Lagos, but there are still so many things that do not project Lagos in the light in which Lagos would like to be projected, how Lagos would like to be perceived as a mega city, a place where business thrives, it is easy to do business, and so on and so forth. How do you think the actual contribution of Lagos to the GDP can be reflected in the people, you know, uh, who make up Lagos, who make Lagos what it is, the ordinary people? Thank you so much for that. Um, Lagos State is supposed to be the commercial capital of Nigeria. Right, and genuinely, if we did what we're supposed to do, Lagos State should be commercial capital of Africa, right? But currently, Lagos ranks, I think, if memory serves, 19th on the ease of doing business. Um, it's lower than Kaduna, that's dealing with all those insecurity issues, right? And there's been so much money that has been borrowed, so much debt that has been earned, and so much money that has been accumulated that's not reflective in the level of development in Lagos State. I, tell, I say to people that by 1966, Lagos State was ranked as one of the best cities in the world, right? It was ranked alongside London, Sao Paulo, right? I think it was 56 out of about 70-something. Now, it is, for the last 10 years, been ranked as one of the worst cities in the world. So, we have a situation where, where Lagos State has been captured. It, I, the concept of state capture is when pretty much an oligarchy or a group of people pretty much control the entire state's resources for their benefits, their family, and their cronies, right? And Lagos State is run for profit as opposed to for the people. And these are the, these are the veins that run through everything. So, for instance, when you have the agro phenomenon, it's tied to that. When you have the monopoly of the BRT buses and only one company is allowed to ply that route, it's tied to that. Especially when you have a deficit in terms of number of buses that you need. Why can't a private individual that meets certain requirements, you know, get his buses on that lane? Why can't a private individual that has the capacity to buy um, this... Um, trucks that are used for waste management, why can't they also be transparently allowed to participate in waste management? Why are all these things so politicized? Why has it taken 20-something years for us to just do 16 kilometers of rail? And they're quoting one point something billion on Lagos State books. The Chinese company is quoting $170 million to their um, stock exchange. Why all this controversy? Because the state is run for profit for people, particular people, as opposed to running to enable people's lives, enable their businesses, allow for, you know, a decentralized level of development all across the state. And that is why we are not seeing the reflection of it. There's a lot of tokenism in Lagos State. You have a situation where, I'm coming from Oshodi. There's the big Oshodi um, interchange for buses and all of that. You know, it looks good. I admit it looks good. But once you go under, the roads are terrible. There is a bridge. You go under the bridge, potholes everywhere. You have the scam of people coming to do roads that will last for six months and then it's washed away. There are potholes everywhere. And then in a year time, they come and do it all over again. But the state just runs to get the headline. Lagos is working. But we are sitting there in four hours traffic every morning to get to work. Right? So we need a government that is free 
from that state capture. A government that can truly be accountable to the people and is not accountable to... I do, it, this has even gone past godfathers. It, oligarchy that is not accountable to people that have truly captured the state and its finances and its resources. And that's the only way Lagos State can actually thrive and return back to the excellence that it once had. Bayer, still with you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, some people have also looked at the industrial capacity. I mean, allied to the question of the contribution to the GDP, is the industrial capacity of Nigeria a significant proportion of which is warehoused in Lagos, between Lagos actually and mm -hmm. Agbara and Otaiyogun state. You have about 60% of the industrial capacity of Nigeria. Um, what new things should be done, you know, to because this 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 has remained like this for a while. Yeah. But what and you know in, in previous times you had what was called the Western Nigeria Marketing Board Estates, Wema Board, which is the whole of Akran, Axis, we saw waste management, all of this done in the first republic by Jifaolo. Yes. But if you look recently, we have not had new industrial parks, industrial development areas, and so on, to take the pressure off the Agbara or the Axis. Mm -hmm. What do you think you could do, which maybe the current administration has not been doing, and that will mark you differently? Okay, and, and even to add to that, you find that a lot of these warehouses are now being sold to churches, because these businesses have gone out of uh, they are not working anymore. And that also ties into the huge unemployment, especially for youth that are facing Lagos. So for me, there are two things. The first thing is ensuring that we deliver four rail lines in four years that will be able to al allow for movement of people and cargo, right? And also allow for Lagos State to work a lot more efficiently um, and enable businesses as well. And then we're going to have industrial parks, right, that are away from the centralized part of Lagos, right? And then also work in partnership with gas producing companies who actually provide electricity and energy and create incentives for industries and companies to go and, um, what's the word, settle and set up there. We'll also look at the current industries that already exist in Lagos State and see how we can partner with them as a stakeholder to ensure that and incentivize them to employ and hire our youth especially with the skills that we'll give them. So all these things will be tied in together, working with the private sector, working with youth as stakeholders, and also creating the skill set that the people, potential employers, will need so they'll make our youth employable. But a major thing that we'll be looking at is decentralizing Lagos and decongesting Lagos, really bringing the Badagri Division and the Kodu Division really into Lagos. Because currently, if Ambode to not do what it did in Ekpe, that whole division will still feel that they are not part of Lagos. So we want to bring them in and create employment in those divisions as well. But we'll be looking at stakeholders, meeting with entrepreneurs, meeting the industrial sector, and looking at putting in policy that will ensure that their lives are enabled and they can flourish in Lagos State. Um, I, would, I would like to talk, touch on the, uh, because you made an allusion to that now in your response, I would like to touch, uh, go back to this question of Lagos as, as a mega city uh, and to see, as, as you spoke about opening up um, Ekwe and Anikorudu uh, and Badagri and actually integrating them into the greater Lagos, so to speak. But there are also, if I understand correctly, the mega city project actually also spans open state. It's not actually only Lagos, you know, because Lagos has also grown to incorporate parts of open state. But if you look at it, there does not appear to be, uh, at least again to us, the public, you know, any, any concrete strategy to fully integrate, you know, open state into Lagos. The water which is consumed, which is, which is um, yeah, consumed at the water works and the new water works, they're in open state. Many people don't know that. They're in open state. So, so in some ways, open state is already somehow integrated, but we don't see that happening. So is it something you are thinking about, in addition to your bringing the Kurudu and Ekwe and 
but that going to Greater Lagos. Do you foresee something like that? But now realizing that in the case of Ogun State, it's an entirely different setup because it's not part of Lagos like Ebra and Badagri and uh, Ikurudu that you mentioned. Yes, uh, that, that's an amazing question. Um, the, the corridor between Abidjan and Lagos State, right, is going to be, it's a megapolis. It's in the makings of being a megapolis. In the next 30, 40 years, it will be the region that houses the most human beings in the world. Right? So, Lagos State in itself must expand horizontally and vertically. So, the easier one is what is alluded to, expansion upwards, which is into Ogun State. And this, for me, will be done mainly by rail. Right? Ensuring that we can create a real network that's connecting us even all the way into Oyo so that people, we can now start to have a situation where is it possible that you live in Ogun State and can get to work for 8 but you woke up at 6.30 or 7? By the time you do this, you start to decongest Lagos State, right? But even in the decongesting, let's understand this, the more we thrive, the more we become excellent, the more we will attract more people. Mm -hmm. So there's also an expansion that's going to happen horizontally as well. That will be in the interest of everybody aligned from here all the way to Abidjan. Lagos State has to see itself not just as a constituent part of Nigeria, but as a city state in itself, right? That has its own expansionist ideas and interests that will be doing this to survive. Because by default, we're currently housing 10% of our population. And that is also potentially going to increase to 15, 16%. There are many factors for this. One, obviously, there's the global warming that's happening that's leading to um, deforestation and all of that that's happening up north. People are always going to continue coming down south. And the more you thrive, the more you're going to attract people. The point is, the capacity that you're getting here, you must have a system that takes them in, gives them skills, gives them education, makes them productive members of society, and puts them to work so that the entire place is generating even more in terms of GDP and also ensuring that people have things to do. Because an idle mind is devil's workshop. Mm -hmm. And that is currently what's happening to a lot of our youth in Lagos State. So yes, I completely agree with you. Um, there's a real line that is supposed that's planned to go from Ota to Marina. We need to make sure that that happens. Um, we also need to make sure we can expand that even more. Um, also, um, right of way sharing that's currently state is doing with the red line. We also need to make sure that that continues to exist and also expand on that as well. We want a Lagos state where, you know, you don't have to live in central Lagos. So you don't have to live in Yaba to be able to work in VI, you know. And also, let's open up other places so you can be going to work in Kurudu. Right? Companies can feel free to set up in Badagri because the train system is connecting you anywhere in Lagos in 35 minutes. You know, that's, that's the vision for Lagos. Okay, but just before I forget, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, when you talk about when you flourish, people come. You attract, you know, light attracts insects and all that. So a problem that arises from population uh, density is education and housing. What's the plan? Yes. So well, I, I, I take exception to the analogy you use, light attracts insects. Because Lagos State takes pride in the idea that they're generating. Mm -hmm. This idea is coming from these people. Mm -hmm. It's from, coming from people in the marketplace. It's coming from Idumata. It's coming from all the people that are waking up so to go to work case, in the morning. the insects are generating the they light. They are generating <laughs> light. <laughs> that is perfect. They are generating light. Now, how do you allow for more of these people to be productive? How do you enable them to flourish, right? As opposed to just taking, 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 and shaking down and taking pride in that. What are the incentives that they get directly for paying those taxes? How can you incentivize the people to actually even pay more, right? So that is what our government is looking at. It's part of my vision for Lagos State. We have the Commonwealth of Lagos. It's a platform that allows for you, whether you're formal or informal, paying taxes to have direct benefits. You, direct, you have direct benefits to healthcare insurance. You have direct benefits to being on the affordable housing ladder. So for instance, going to your, to your question, affordable housing, we have about a three million housing deficit in Lagos State. This cannot be done and fixed just by the government. Private sector needs to get involved as well. But in terms of government, just like Alaji Latif Jaconde did, we're going to do massive um, housing, right? 
But we're going to do it in a way that will be open and transparent and the winners that get to bear this housing will meet certain conditions. One, they're taxpayers, right? And I'm not saying you have to be a taxpayer, you're paying hundreds of millions, right? You're a taxpayer, formal and informal. You can show, and we have to automate our tax collection, even in the informal sector, because there are all these multiple taxations that people are dealing with. The woman in Lagos Island in the markets complain about multiple taxation and still taxation. The northerner in Igomu that are selling scrap metals complain about the same thing. People are just coming and taking, 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 right? So once you can, we automate this so there's evidence of it. And then there's a lottery. You pay a certain money to get into the lottery, and it's transparently given. No situation where you build housing and you're selling it among yourselves, it never really gets to the market, or when it does, it's selling for a price that is, you know, unrealistic for somebody looking for affordable housing. So that is something that we are going to change. And we're also going to partner with the private sector. So we have a social housing um, component where we're cross-selling, not cross-selling, we're cross-financing. So all the funds that are generated from these high luxury buildings, funds that the government is making, we're taking that and putting it into building affordable housing, right? And then we are making transparent. We are really going out to people to let them know this is available. It's not something where you must know somebody to get involved in it. We're going to use technology to just make everything transparent and even the playing field so everybody can get on that ladder. And when you're on that ladder, if you get off it, you cannot sell it to somebody else. It goes back to the government to make it available for somebody else that is in need, right? And then also bringing credit into the system because a lot of our moral decadence is because there is no credit. You must accumulate so much money to buy a car. You must accumulate so much money to rent a house. You are paying for your house rent in one year up front or two years sometimes up front. These things need to change. And we need to reward proper wealth management. So this credit system will also be brought into the Commonwealth of Lagos as a platform. So healthcare, education, um, education, sorry, healthcare accommodation, education I need to talk about. I'm very passionate about education. Um, there's innovation that's bringing, being brought into our education system. Lagos State will claim, you know, they've done 300 schools out of 1,009. Question, how long did it take for your policy to get to the point where you did only 300 schools? The same mediocrity that I'm talking about, you're taking 23 years to deliver on 16 kilometers of rail. We need focus on education and healthcare and massive implementation to reach as many people as possible and continuity, not this flip-flop of policy. You know, somebody is doing this um, implementation. By the next year, they have... To, we move the person, the person no longer doing it. That innovation has died. We need consistency, policy consistency. And we need to be able to deliver education with innovation and with technology to all the schools in Lagos State. And invest heavily in it. And not just that, to ensure that because there's a high dropout rate once you get to high school. But by that point, you must make sure that they have practical skills and practical knowledge. You know, I, I went to school in, in Nigeria up until SS1. And most of the knowledge that we got was cramming. There was no practical, there was no desire to, for people to learn the practical application of these things that they're learning. And that's where we need to get to. Because there are in-demand jobs now that we can train our people to have. You don't have to go to university and you'll be earning more than people that went to university. So we track these things, make sure that our people have access to this knowledge create infrastructure for them. So like for instance, in every local government who have these work and training stations where you can walk in there for free, learn these skills, and we open, up, we open you up to the world to be able to compete on that global scale. Okay. I know that Bio is uh, itching to ask more questions, but unfortunately we don't have that much time, Bio. Uh, maybe and I really enjoyed this question. <laughs> just, 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 just one quick one. Yeah, if if we can deliver in 30 seconds. Yes. Let's try. Uh, yeah, uh, the APC has been in power for long, and you alluded to that as well in your very incisive comments. Now, how are you going to dislodge them? How how are you going to make sure you know people can see you as a better alternative to the APC? Okay, 30 seconds. The APC has only held power because of voter apathy. 16% of people come out to vote in elections, about 84% are staying at home because they do not believe in the system. They, believe, they don't believe that their votes will change anything and they are hopeless. But now 
there is a movement of people that have hope. There's a movement of people that believe that their votes will count. Beavers has come, there's transmission of um, votes directly from the polling units to the server. So people know that their votes will count. And there's an awakening that has happened. The seed was planted during the NSAS movement where people realized that there must be a two-way traffic between governance and the citizenry. And that has taken on a new turn and a whole huge tree has grown, which is the obedient movement, which is people that believe that they're going to participate in elections, they're going to mobilize without being mobilized, they're going to make their voices heard and they're going to come out and vote and deliver a servant leader. And that is what is going to take Lagos forward. We're relying on the people. We know the people are going to get their voters' cards. Those that already do, we're counting on them to come out and vote. And that's the only way we can actually get leadership that will serve the people as opposed to the oligarchy and state capture. Okay, the time is up, but uh, a yes or no can suffice in this question I'm going to ask. Lagos, you think about Lagos, you think of Agbero. If you come in, is it possible to stop the menace of Agbero on the Lagos streets? We will not only stop them, we will give them a better alternative means of earning a living. Beautiful. Well, <laughs> that's, that's uh, from uh, uh, our guest here, the governorship candidate for Labour Party Lagos State. I'm talking about Badebo Roads Forever. And um, he's been talking to us about a lot of other issues, not just uh, because he is the governorship candidate of Labour Party, but because he's a passionate youth that wants a new order in the political realm of our country. And we're hoping that you did enjoy it. But we know that as we get closer and closer to the election time, we will still have need to talk with you. Always. It's our pleasure to have you My on the show today. Well. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for coming. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a break now and take the news. And when we return, the show continues for the last lap of the journey. Stay with us. <laughs>